So in the next couple of minutes, I'll be speaking on our research on the, uh, one of the studies that we're doing and the overarching objective that we are giving it, uh, which is to really understand the social genomic risk determinant of prostate cancer among black men. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, sorry, among African men. Yeah, and, uh, and you see why I keep making uh, made that mistake, a black man and African man. And the reason is that we do our study on both sides of the Atlantic. And so we often compare indigenous African men with you know African American men. But for today, most of the data I'm going to show will be the data that we have, you know, getting from um African men. And so if you look at the global crime data, particularly 2022, the most recent one, what you see for the incident of prostate cancer is that it's sort of evenly distributed uh, globally, except where you have the low incident in the, in the Asia. Uh, but if you look at the mortality, you see that Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, bear the body of this disease. However, these heat maps don't really do justice to it until you look at the pie chart and you look at the overall cancer incidence among men in Africa, you realize that prostate cancer is leading uh, occupying over 20%. And then when it comes to mortality, prostate cancer is still leading. And so when it comes to the burden of this disease in Africa, it's really a huge concern. But then if you look at where the foundation of this disparity started coming out was from the study in the United States, where they were able to really compare the two you know, racial group, looking at comparing African-Americans with European-Americans. And if you took the data published by Power Talk quite a number of years ago, 2010, and you look at it and you sort of figure it out, what you realize is that the disparity begins to emerge from age 40 and above. Now, we look at data that we're seeing from Nigerian men looking at the, the right you know, panel. What we see is that because most Nigerian men, when they're diagnosed with prostate cancer, they often get, you know, androgen deprivation therapy, either through orchidectomy or through, you know, pharmaceutical intervention. But then you realize that after two years or so, over 50% of them then return with castration resistant prostate cancer. So, so these are the issues that we are grappling with. But again, there are still arguments going on about whether racial disparity in prostate cancer is real or not. And the next couple of slides, you just you know, you know, permit me to really show you some imagined data, very recent, that are really pointing at, yes, racial disparity is real. I'll give you an example of two papers, you know, you know published by Kosje, you know, Yamua. Uh, they really show that even when you look at data from the U.S. veteran system, when you normalize for access to care, you normalize for everything, black men still have higher risk of developing this disease. And when they do develop, they still have higher risk of dying from this disease. Again, Max, this is from the veteran. When you look at data from the United Kingdom, uh, this recent publication, I think this publication you know, came out last year or early this year, thereabout. You and what they did was that they looked at several thousand, over several thousand men. That's a huge, you know, you know, you know, population that they study, and then they stratify the age proportion of men that present across different age. You realize that between the age of forty to seventy, black men are still disproportionately impacted by this disease compared to white counterpart and Asian counterpart. And recently, a couple of weeks ago, this paper came out. They look at black the you know, prostate cancer among black men in Canada. And the result is very clear. Men who identify as black were diagnosed with prostate cancer at an early age. So there's something about race that is becoming, that is clearly an, a risk factor for this disease. But when you're talking about determinants of a disease, generally, and zero into prostate cancer, we know it cannot, you can't just take you know, race uh, or, or ethnicity as either a social or a biological concept. So we need to look at it holistically. And so there are several factors. We can classify them into two. You can talk about the social determinants, and then we can talk about the biological determinants. Okay, of course, if we're talking about social determinants, we're talking about lifestyle exposure, socioeconomic status, access to care, discrimination that individual experience, language, a cultural barrier, you know, delay in disease diagnosis, of course, this distance to, you know, healthcare facilities and all of that. However, as I showed you from OSGEN data and other data that I've shown, when you normalize for all of these, the disparity 
still exist, particularly in the biology of the tumor and the present and, and the stage uh, and the great art presentation. And so we started looking about the biological, you know, you know, factor. Now we're talking about genetics, the hereditary risk allele, you know, DNA methylation, you know, differences in acquired chromosome aberration, inflammatory response, and what have you. And so I'm going to like so I'd like to take us back a little bit to say this disparity in cancer generally has it always been there. And you can go back, look at publications on over 100 years ago or more in the early 1900s and what have you. What data showing you know, people were reporting that time was that, particularly in the West Coast of Africa, that prostate cancer generally was rare. Example of the publication is this one. They say freedom of Negro race from cancer. And they say it's observed for 22 years. And it clearly suggests that there's reality of cancer. Again, you look at another publication, and that was the first publication was in Lagos. This, new, this next publication I'm showing you, which was published in the British Medical Journal in 1923, about one year and one years ago, really look at the population in the northern part of Nigeria, Shokoto, and look at a population of about 9 million people. And they said they were only able to see one case of breast cancer. And of course, talk about how that specimen was taken to the Royal College of Surgeon and all of that. But it was arguing that, look, if the cancer, if there was a lot of cancer, the body was high, they were going to see it because the women were not, you know, fully clothed. You know, they were walking about, you know, like half naked and all of that. And so that was the argument that time. But around the same time in 1910, this J. Randu published this, what I consider to be a pioneering you know, publication in the area of the role of genetics or the risk of, of cancer. He talked about a case of an indigenous man that around 1892 or 1893, that it was observed the man that the man had breast cancer. He persuaded the man that he should allow him to you know, surgically exceed, excise the, the tumor. Eventually, the man agreed, but subsequently, the man died. And years later, 20 years or there about later, the son of the same man presented with the same thing. So why argument was going on about the burden of whether the body was low? Again, there were cases that really showed that there's something about genetics of familiarity, you know, no, 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 hereditary as far as cancer is concerned. So what exactly do we now know about that genetic component? Unfortunately, not so much work has been done particularly because one, when science advanced to say to, to the level that yes, for us to understand that there's racial disparity, the proportion of the genomic information that we have to really understand that, gen that disparity came from the Caucasian population. Now that we have the understanding and that we try to stratify that we have you know, white, we have black, again, we really didn't really appreciate how heterogeneous the black population is. And we can see this from the, uh, you know, the, the, the human population you know, no, no, you know, structure uh, of the entire human race, that Africa is highly genetically diverse. And the way we really understand this diversity will help us to interpret you know, how the influence of genetics on disease outcome. Again, when you look at the right panel, you clearly see even data from Nigeria showing how heterogeneous genetically the ethno-linguistic group even within Nigeria is. Again, it's similar across, across Africa. And so what does these differences in genetics mean? Well, what is, where, how come we have these differences? Of course, it's over the years, thousands of years of genetic adaptation and what have you, genetic adaptations to environment, infectious disease, geography, diet, and these environment influence the germline deterioration that we now have. And the challenge before us now is to understand the impact of this germline deterioration with the modern environment that we live in, particularly with the social cultural environment and how those, those two come together to really influence a disease like prostate cancer. So the next couple of slides, I'm going to show some data from our research that we're doing to really understand genetic factors and a little bit of social factors influencing prostate cancer. And so we actually, our consortium, which is the Prostate Cancer Transatlantic Consortium, published this old exome sequencing of prostate cancer in Nigerian men. I will compare, compare it with uh, TCGA data of African Americans and European Americans. And clearly, what we saw was very fascinating in that the mutations rank high 
if genes associated with homologous repair pathway, the BRCA2, APC, ATM, BRCA1. When you look at data from African American, you don't have that level of enrichment in the mutation. Of course, European American, those genes don't even really rack high. And then when you look at this data further, again, what we zero in on now, this, this is the, the Nigerian data, no, 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 data zero in on BRCA1, for example. You see, you know, SNPs that are very, you know, enriched in this population, and you begin to see a SNP like RS79917. And I wanted to put that at the back of your mind because that SNP is going to reoccur in other data that I'm going to show. Again, you know, working with, you know, your team there, Luis, you know, Stefano, uh, you know, very privileged to contribute to this work. Then this work, again, identifying the same SNP that we've seen in the other previous paper that we published, the same RS79917. And then the other part of our, our CAPTC publication was that we then look at the uh, you know, benign prostate hyperplasia and we identified the similar mutation in BRCA1 that's very enriching almost all the, the samples that we, we looked at. Again, we started thinking that this may be more from a line than even somatic mutation. Really? And so right now in our lab, what we're now doing is that we're doing a lot of jam line sequencing to really understand the pathogenic duration, not, not even the general duration, because we really need to be very careful now to really know whether a SNP is pathogenic or not, particularly in this population. So we're just looking at what are the common variations that we have across the BRCA1, BRCA2, and other cancer-assisted genes. But now I'll show them, I'm showing you data for BRCA1. Again, what you see again is, you see, 799917, you know, coming up, you know, just as we have seen before. And you realize that that mutation is within this block of SNP that really influence uh, within this particular exome. And depending on the transcript of the, the, the transcript of BRCA1, there are two transcripts actually of BRCA1 that do not have that exome. What implication does that have on prostate cancer we're yet to know? So anyway, with the observation of that the role of PAP, PAP inhibitor in, you know, in the breast cancer, particularly triple negative breast cancer, clinical trials were done to really study the role of you know, the PAP inhibitor in metastatic castration resistant you know, prostate cancer. Again, when you then look, and this is the sad part of the work, is that when you look at the data that was used, only three black men were involved in the clinical trial. Because the trial was done in the US, 200 men were recruited, only three black men. Again, this is for a disease that disproportionately affects black men. When you look at the follow up study that was done on Talazoparib, only South Africa you know, was recruited. And I'm, look, if you look at the data, you really then begin to see that not so much black men were included. Of course, the drugs were approved. And we know that part of the challenges that we have in including particularly African population, indigenous African population in this type of study is the ability to sequence BRCA and other associated genes, APC, ATM. And so what we're doing now in Nigeria is that we're developing this capacity, we're showing indigenous capacity to really demonstrate that this can be done locally. And this is the type of mutations that we have within our population. And the kind of, again, you remember I said that Nigerian, you know, you know black, you know, Nigerian men often develop, I mean, we have high proportion of castration resistant, you know, prostate cancer. And so with this type of, you know, evidence showing that the population is enriched with BRCA mutation, clearly we're not talking to AstraZeneca, for example, to really let them know that we have genetic factors that will make our population to benefit uh, from all our pure, uh, or part, generally part in Peter. And so this part of our study is to really understand the tumor biology and really begin to identify what are the differential signature that prostate cancer in Nigeria may present. So we did the RNA-6 study, and here we see clearly the difference in the heat map you know, for the same you know, you know, prostate tumor of the same glycine score. You can see that the, the mutation, the, the transcriptomics pattern are clearly different. And when you look at the heat map, uh, sorry, when you compare the heat map to Volcano Plot, we clearly they began to really identify genes, particularly with our group focused on this TDO2. We targeted it further to then look at the role that TDO2 play. We know that TDO2 uh, is 
you know, as you know, responsible for conversion of tryptophan to calnery, and then going down that way, and the calnery down products are then used for immunosuppression that allows the cancer cells to evade the immune system. We look at the population, you know, in Nigeria, we did case control study. Clearly, we showed that calnery is up, you know, level of calnery, circulating calnery is higher. But we didn't then look, stop that way. We started investigating what are the factors beyond genetic factors, what are the social factors regulating, you know, TDO or level. We clearly saw that inflammation is another biological factor that influences the level of TDO. I also see that stress now, you know, interacting through cortisol and HPA axis also impact the level of expression of TDO2. And it was on this back, you know, on this hypothesis, we use this to develop the hypothesis, integrating it with the intermediary, the role of biological factor and the other factor in the inter play as intermediary determinant of health. Uh, and knowing that stress is very critical to uh, at, at the intersection between the biological and social factor that really influence health outcome. And so with this, we 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 we, we, we use this as an hypothesis to apply for the DOD Eureka Award two years ago, and we're lucky to be funded to establish what we call the establishment of an inclusive cancer care research and equity for Black Men Consortium. And uh, we have five projects on that, and Project Five really looked at the role of you know you know stress in determining prostate cancer uh, you know risk and outcome. And I'll just show you this, you know, one of the results that we're finding. Clearly, so what we did was that we measured allostatic load. And even the general population, I would measure allostatic load in, in the prostate cancer patient. We have over 300, you know, case control studies. So the, the result you see, because it's just for, you know, control alone. Because we didn't want to mix the data for control with the cases. Because the question would then come that what causes the stress that we're seeing? Is it the cancer diagnosis that causes the stress or the stress causes the cancer diagnosis? So for this hypothesis, we're testing does stress influence prostate cancer biomarker, looking at PSA, free PSA and total PSA. Clearly what we identify is that measuring stress with the with allostatic load show that stress as it is with a measure of allostatic load is not really a factor for elevated PSA. Rather, we started seeing signature around lipid, that lipid metabolism, you know, influence prostate cancer risk in apparently every individual who have never been diagnosed with prostate cancer before. Again, we also look at uh, the HPA pathway response to stress. We identify SNPs that are very significant. Uh, and we're writing up the mouse too. What is very important is the way, you know, we collaborated now with ICPPE. Again, I really want to appreciate Stefano and Louis, you know, for, for this collaboration. And he has been born, yeah, one of my PhD students, I mean, my PhD student who is working with, you know, another MSc student, uh, you know, Tola, who both of them are working together on this data right now. And I'll just show you some of the things that, you know, you know, distill the data for that, what we're saying is that clearly you can see glycan B and glycan A upregulated in prostate cancer patients, indicating inflammation. But more importantly, you see from the other panel that lipids are highly upregulated in prostate cancer patients compared to BPH and then compared to control. And so we know that there's a cross talk between DNA repair mechanism and inflammation. And I believe that, it, I mean, and the next thing that we're looking at is to really look at our data and see how those, you know, uh, those, that hypothesis holds true in our population and our data. But, in our consortium, we have also, you know, studied further the role of inflammation in prostate cancer, particularly building on these two uh, very important study, one led by uh, Dr. René Rims uh, from uh, 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 Taliase, uh, you know, uh, uh, right there, the Florida A and M University in Taliase, in you know, Florida, and she showed that we can actually use inflammatory signature to distinguish between the prostate cancer observed in, you know, as presented in African-American and Caucasian. And Stefan Arms of the NCI really then beat on that foundation, but really clearly showing that men who take regular aspirin have reduced risk of developing aggressive prostate cancer. And so in our work, we started looking at the role of vitamin D, that vitamin D plays in regulating inflammatory pathway uh, and overall outcome of prostate cancer. We beat that on this work done by, you know, no, no, 
uh, Adima. And when he did that, that he administered you know, 4,000 IU of vitamin D to men when they present with prostate cancer. They, allowed, they, they, they administered that to them for two months. And then after two months, of course, they take the initial biopsy and they took the follow-up biopsy after two months. And it clearly showed that when black men take regular vitamin D consistently for two months, it clearly erased the inflammatory signature seen in at the first biopsy. And we know that, again, inflammation drives prostate cancer in black men. Again, further studies have shown that vitamin D can actually sensitize tumor for, you know, it can reduce sensitivity of tumor. And so, and so this is some of the data that we've, show, we, we, we've published. And um, again, working with you know, Dr. Clayton Yates, and she is now, it was formerly at Tuskegee, is now at Joss Optin, Maureen Campbell, it was, it's now moving at Sydney Senai, and then, you know, the Bode, uh, Bode was my undergraduate, my master's student, my PhD student. He worked on this extensively. He has now moved on to Johns Hopkins for his postdoctoral study. And um, in summary, we, for, we clearly, you know, see that vitamin D level, you know, is lower when you compare cases versus control of prostate cancer. And this level really uh, it is consistent across the stage and grade. And we showed that the role that vitamin D plays in black in prostate cancer of blacks you know, of of uh, of black origin is completely different from the role it play in prostate cancer cells of white origin. And what vitamin D does is that of course it's not an hormone. Uh, sorry, it's not a vitamin but an hormone. Vitamin D then interacts with vitamin D receptor, you know, no, no, you know, vitamin D receptor, and then recruits, you know, other you know, regulator like you know, SMACA1 and bas a one to really regulate gene expression in a way that also interacts with you know, circadian rhythms and you know regulates inflammation. So it's does a whole lot of complex things that we're trying, we see trying to really distill out. And part of the things that it does is in the inflammatory, in regulating inflammation. And then when we completed, so we're running off our IKEA phase one, which is for two years in this August, but early this year we we, we applied for for phase two, and part of the study that we're doing in phase two is that we're collaborating with Professor Adebumule Kupuwana, the urologist in Nigeria, and this project is led by you know, Dr. Gerardo Colotero at Mayo Clinic. That we're now going to be sort of re evaluating what Adina did in the US, but we're not doing perhaps, we're not looking at circulatory if serum inflammatory level, and then administer vitamin D to men presented with prostate cancer and associating it with the role that typically, you know, if that, you know, mutation plays. You know, we're just at the end of the day, looking for a way to put all of it together. And so, um, as I, I conclude, uh, our approach is to really look at the way we address prostate cancer burden in Africa, relying on a model that integrates complex interplay between genetics, environment, and behavior. So i uh, be happy to take questions. I really want to appreciate all our funders, the U.S. Department of Defense, NIH, through the NCI, the NCI Center for Global Health, which put a lot of our you know, work in, in Africa. And then really want to thank the, uh, uh, you know, the, the research participants, uh, data for us so through the CPTAC. Uh, it's a multi-omic study that they, they, they're doing the analysis right, right now. The data is not yet out. We're part of the IOMA clinical trial that is funded by Moveba Foundation and PCCTC. Um, again, really want to appreciate my group members for all the support and active you know, dedication in the lab. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions.